everybody and welcome to this session. Thanks so much for coming. Our first speaker is Professor Jen Jennifer Pontius, she's the director of EMC, a Northern Research Station Research Ecologist. Um, and her affiliation is University of Vermont and the US Forest Service. And her talk is modeling hemlock bully adult risk and impacts of pre-salvage harvesting on carbon stacks in northern Vermont parks. Thanks, Rebecca. So this is going to be a grand experiment because uh, these are actually two separate studies from completely different data with completely different methods and different questions, but they seem to be relevant and related, um, and I didn't want to fall two time slots. So, so really two different papers, both are currently under revision right now. Um, one is done by Jeffrey Krebs, who was one of my graduate students here with the help of Paul Schauber, um, trying to understand how northern hemlock forests might be changing in response to in the imminent HWA infestation. Um, and then the second one is a regional study actually looking at tree cores that was done in collaboration with some partners at the University of Maine, um, trying to understand why some hemlock stands seem to decline more rapidly than others. So um, in an attempt to, to make this make sense, just to go over the big picture, mo most of what we know about hemlock and hemlock really delta really does stem from the southern New England mid-Atlantic studies. That makes sense, right? That's where HWA is, that's where most of the work is done. But clearly our hemlock forests are different than mid-Atlantic and southern New England hemlock forests. So we might expect them um, to respond differently. But we do know from the literature, uh, hemlock can die relatively quickly, but there are some stands that persist sometimes for decades. Um, we also know that it's, it's uh, primarily limited by extreme winter temperatures, so the hemlock fully adult populations are not back with extreme cold. There are some studies that have looked at the sort of variable susceptibility to try and tease that out. Um, but the results seem to vary as to which uh, variables are important. Um, and then the other thing that you'll hear people quote, I actually just heard Tony D'Amato say this yesterday, black birch, we're gonna have nothing but black birch because that's what's predicted to replace hemlock forest. I don't know about you, but I don't have a whole lot of black birch in my forest. Um, so in terms of management, we know we have several options. Chemical control seems to work well, but doesn't, it isn't really appropriate for larger landscapes. Um, there are a lot of um, efforts around biological control, but what's really interesting about these efforts is that they're probably going to be most successful if you can target them in stands that you know have an HWA population, but the trees are not um, severely impacted yet, so that whatever um, impact you have on that population, the trees can still recover. And then what was uh, common in the past, particularly, uh, were preemptive harvest or salvage harvest in an attempt to either improve resistance of stands um, or just to recoup potential financial losses. And so these two studies are really trying to inform, I would say, these, these two bottom parts, right? If we need to target our biological controls, where might we be most likely to find hemlock stands that can tolerate infestation at low levels? Um, and then also, should we really be encouraging people to be managing for preemptive harvest within stands um, or those salvage harvests? So again, to get at that, there's two different studies. I'm going to try to keep it simple by referring to one as just hemlock stand dynamics because that's what we were doing, was trying to simulate how um, hemlock stands would change following infestation or harvesting activities. And the other one I'm just going to call hemlock growth response because we were actually looking at those basal area increment cores and trying to quantify more subtly changes following infestation with the goal of mapping relative susceptibility. Okay, so we'll start with that. Hemlock stand dynamics. Again, speed talk, you get one slide of methods. Um, basically, we used FIA inventory plots from hemlock uh, dominated stands across only northern New England. So we wanted to focus these efforts where most of the research has not already been, um, been done. Um, we then used the forest vegetation simulator to model regeneration, growth, and mortality of every tree within those plots so that we could see how these stands might grow and their structure and species composition would change over time under four different scenarios. So we had a no disturbance control. We used a hemlock event monitor to simulate HWA infestation. Um, we used a diameter limit thinning to remove the hemlock to simulate pre-salvage logging. And then we had a combined scenario too, right? Because if you think about it, we may be doing a pre-salvage <laughs> activity, but that hemlock fully delta never shows up. We wanted to make sure that we had that absent HWA and then the with HWA scenarios. So what did we find? So these are just uh, graphs of species composition so your eyeballs don't bug out. So we're just looking at um, how hemlock species composition as percent basal area changes under each of these different HWA pre-salvage and then combined scenarios. And then you can see 
see that under all three scenarios, hemlock is pretty much vanishing from um, these stands. The rate at which they're lost is what differs, and obviously we're really hammering it. We do both uh, the preemptive uh, harvest and expect infestation. But the other thing that's interesting is what's replacing it. So it might be hard to see, but this, in all three of these scenarios, this dotted line right here, any guesses can you tell? Red maple. So in northern New England, we are not going to see black birch. We are going to see red maple. And it's not going to be an initial spike of red maple. It's going to be red maple that persists. So this is a 150-year simulation. Um, we also see some differences in, for example, like sugar maple um, composition that does vary. So maybe if you're concerned about replacing certain replacement species, you might consider some of these different management alternatives. But I think what is really concerning about this is that there is no functionally similar species that seem to be increasing um, in competition following either infestation or moody salvage. Balsam fir is the only conifer of note. We've listed basically all of the common species on these plots. So um, not just losing hemlock, but also not replacing them with anything that is ecologically similar in terms of their function. Um, so then this was also used to look at carbon storage. We know that um, northeastern forests are a tremendous sink for carbon, and one of the largest terrestrial sinks for carbon. And hemlock is a superstar among those. It's long-lived, it grows very big, it, it rots very slowly. So we wanted to see what kind of an impact this would have on carbon sequestration and storage. And obviously there are some really interesting short-term dynamics between these four different scenarios. The one that I thought was most interesting is that you actually see an increase in total, total carbon in the short term for just the HWA infestation. And that's because even though these trees may die, they're still standing dead or down dead or then in the soil um, pools for carbon, carbon pools. And so we actually retain um, carbon for quite a bit of time following infestation. Long term though, all three of these scenarios were significantly lower than the control. So when we add this up um, and we take the sort of the mean of all of our different stands and how much carbon is lost based on these three different scenarios and then extrapolate that across the landscape, we're talking about four million metric tons of carbon that are not going to be sequestered and stored by these forests um, over the next 150 years. And again, this is only for that small sort of subregion of northern New England. Um, if we think about not just carbon storage at a specific time, but we look at that net change in carbon. So imagine you're sort of summing all of the area under the curve to get an idea again at what sequestration might look like. And then it becomes really interesting because even though all three of these scenarios look similar in the end in terms of their total carbon at that time snapshot, actually letting hemlock woolly indulgent progress naturally through a stand has a net cumulative higher carbon storage than any of these other scenarios. So if you are actually interested in managing for carbon or for long-term sequestration, pre-salvage harvests are not the way to go, even though it appears at the end that they recover. So that, again, that net cumulative carbon storage is much um, significantly higher for HWA. So if we were trying to make recommendations, again, this is a quick snapshot, it seems that allowing um, HWA to progress naturally through these stands, if you are interested in um, carbon storage as a management, um, a management target, that you should just let that happen and not, not work towards preemptive or salvage harvest. But maybe what's more disturbing is this loss of a keystone species, um, particularly, again, considering that red maple is what we are likely to see coming back in. And, and this conclusion of maybe letting HWA progress naturally is not, this is not the first study that has, has shown that. There are lots of other reasons why perhaps um, being lighter on harvesting as a, as a management tool might work for an infestation like this in terms of maintaining genetic diversity um, and also allowing for less abrupt changes to other ecosystem processes. So that was my three minute that talk. Let's switch to the different, the different <coughs> now. So now, so now we're talking about hemlock growth response. Um, this was a study that was built off of long-term monitoring plots across the Northeast. We spanned from um, southern New Hampshire at some infestation sites all the way down to the Delaware Water Gap in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. And we had been monitoring these for canopy condition um, and HWA population dynamics. But then we had a grad student who went in and cored these trees to try and see if we could use basal area increment as a sort of finer proxy for response to infestation. It's kind of hard to just use um, a subjective canopy vigor or transparency measure to really see the smaller or more subtle changes over time. Um, and so we then wanted to take these basal area increment cores and identify the HWA infestation P 
periods and link that to site stand and climate characteristics at each of those sites across the region to see if we can maybe create a model of relative risk. Like how likely are you to experience a decline like this if you're invested versus being able to sustain growth um, for longer periods of time? Um, and so the first thing we had to figure out is, is basal area increment even a useful proxy? Right? No one else has really looked at this to see whether or not there's so much variability and noise in the data set that you can't tell when infestation began and when it didn't. And while we did see the effects of other stress events, for example, drought conditions that were documented, um, we were able to link very tightly these basal area increments, basically the slope of change to both canopy condition um, down here, here's canopy decline rating, and then also in infestation levels, so HWA infestation levels. So we were comfortable using this to then classify stands into stands that are relatively susceptible and will decline rapidly compared to those that were relatively resistant and would be able to tolerate infestation for longer. And so once we had that, we went then just used a logistical regression to be able to predict the probability that any given stand would decline rapidly, fall into that category, or be able to tolerate infestation. And of all of these different stand and site and climate characteristics, there really were just three that popped up as being significant in differentiating that relative risk of decline following <coughs> infestation. And these are things that I think make sense to all of us who have been thinking about homophily Belgian. First of all, you are likely, or you have a higher probability of rapid decline if you were in a site with warmer minimum January temperatures. That makes sense. We know that HWA um, is that's too cold limited. Um, we also found that summer hill shade. So now we're getting an aspect, but very specifically, the intensity of solar radiation during the growing season when hemlock might experience water stress. So it's really a, a different way of looking at aspect and getting at um, water stress. And then also on steeper slopes, and we hypothesize that this gets, again, a, a water, water availability um, and your ability uh, to tolerate drought conditions. So if you're on a site with a steeper slope, you would expect there to be more rapid drainage and shallow soils. Okay, so when we use these variables, so we have these three, if we were to map these across the landscape, we did this um, under three different climate time stamps. So there was only one climate variable that was significant in our risk model. If we look at the historical um, January minimum temperatures using 71 to 2000 as a base, um, we see that these areas in red have a very high probability of declining rapidly, and then as you get into the green, there's a very low probability. Keep in mind, this has nothing to do with HWA spread. This is just looking at susceptibility if HWA were to infest your, your site. Um, when we now switch <coughs> out and look at the 81 to 2010 normals, look at how this changes in spread. So now we're starting to see much more coming up into southern New Hampshire, even some spots along the coast in Maine, um, up the valley in New York. So, so those who are like, oh, climate change, I don't know, we've already seen changes that are this extreme that impact the ecological, um, the relative risk of hemlock. And then if we were actually to use projected climate change, so if we use a low emissions um, scenario, now we're up to about two degrees in that January minimum temperature, and now we're starting to see Wow, a whole heck of a lot more area that is going to be likely or probable of a rapid decline following infestation. So what does that mean, big picture? Um, if you want to think about proportions of our hemlock um, forest that will be impacted, if we look just at that historical map, about 17% of hemlock across the entire northeastern region were likely susceptible to rapid decline. When we now use our sort of current climate scenario, we're up to 26%. When we use that projected um, climate change scenario, 42% of our hemlock are likely to decline rapidly. But what's interesting, in, in my opinion, is what's not likely to decline. So look at these maps again. Let's go back. Look at all these areas that are not that, that likely will still be able to tolerate infestation. This should be a hopeful message, right? And, and the idea is that maps like this will hopefully help land manager, managers identify you know, where does it make sense uh, to really focus our efforts and, and you know, apply these management techniques where we expect they might already work. So, uh, you know, the big take home message, it's coming, it, it is coming, um, but that we, we do have management tools that we can use that might help us mitigate some of the impacts, and this is such a unique um, ecosystem that Hemlock, such a niche that Hemlock fills. So, so being able to target our control efforts um, is something that we should really be looking at. So more of this niche mapping um, and risk mapping is going to be useful. Um, and then trying to minimize those impacts to ecological processes. So being careful with the application of preemptive harvests. 
And then the other thing too to think about is if we would like to manage more for a transition to functionally similar species, do we want to go the route of planting and trying to bring in maybe white pine um, or balsam fir at some of the higher latitudes so that we can at least maintain some of those dense conifer stands. So that is, um, that's it. That's all I have. And well, thank you for listening to my world mentor, tour and I will be available to answer questions later if we don't have time. Oh, we have time. Only one minute. Three more minutes. Oh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> yeah, Barbara. Yeah, Jen, are those all those masks going to be available? Absolutely. So um, we thank you, BMC. So that we will have a project through our front end management portal where these maps will be available, and they are all at a 30 meter resolution. Yeah, yeah. So again, I think if you need to combine them with some spread risk maps, you call that hazard hazard versus risk. I don't really know the terminology, but I think maybe some some tool to combine those might be really interesting. Yeah. Uh, in, in the same way that insects and plants develop resistance to pesticides over time, do you expect the same thing with HWA and coal? It's certainly possible. That you really want to talk to this guy right here. He's the bug guy. I mean, that certainly is something that we're concerned about, right? Because it's never a hundred percent of HWA that are knocked back. It's always like. 92%. So that 8% must be, you know, able to tolerate the cold. Does that mean they're the ones having the babies? And yes, so it's a possibility, but does it really even matter when we're warming this rapidly? Like we're, we're kind of screwed either way is how I look at it. So we really need to focus, that sounded bad. We really need to focus, I think, in areas where, you know, we have, it's, it's not just general climate. The whole, you know, state of New York isn't going to change the exact same way. We have microclimate, and I think we can take advantage of that in our management is what I'm trying to point out here. There are other questions so so the way that FBS works is it actually uses every single tree from the FIA inventories and then it simulates regeneration based on inputs that we give it. And so we looked at regeneration studies from across the Northeast, Bill Leak did a lot of them to populate what we expect for each species, their regeneration patterns. So That would be an excellent question for Jeff. I think they say viable for several years after the big events. If you had this big mortality, there's no HWA left, there's no hemlock. Right. Potentially, there's got to be some chance for some escape there. Wouldn't that be awesome? The good news is Adrian Longmanville is going to be psyched for all those red maple that's going to be good. Thank you.